Uh, yeah, what's, what's the procedure we have happening here? We started. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, basically, what I, what I'm doing is I'm loading up a bunch of sounds um, into different channels of this machine, and uh, when I've done that, I'm just going to fool around. With group of sounds with which to compose a piece of music as a rhythm sequence in the computer. So what, what I've now got here is my, these sounds, double bass, sure. bass drum, snare, cymbal right, a sound called Orc 5 and a glockenspiel. And uh, the, pro well, the procedure from there would be that I take individual sounds, I can make loops of them in various ways so that they will repeat uh, however I want them. And uh, I'll set up the harmonic envelopes of the sound like that. And uh, I'll fool around with the actual individual segments of the sound as much as I want. Uh, and, um, various things like the sustain of the keyboard, that kind of thing. When I've done all of that and I've got the sounds the way I want them, I can. Uh, give myself a sequence of music like this and uh, record one line at a time. So, for example, if I wanted to, um, so I wanted to put down a glockenspiel line, then uh, I would set the machine running in record, like so, and playing the notes that I want like this. I don't know if you can get in on this line here. But so the machine is now remembering the notes that I'm playing. And they're becoming part of the composition. And that's the way you go about it. So you know like having written the Glockenspiel line, maybe write the symbol line. And so on. I'm sorry you can't hear any of this, but it's top secret. <laughs> Are, are we allowed to see some incongruity between somebody who composes on an electronic palette and cuts his tape in the other room with a razor blade? The incongruity? Yeah. <laughs> Why incongruity? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen my modern ballet dance thing yet. <laughs> That's what I call incongruity. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know I was a keen angler? <laughs> oh, you were. Yeah. You know, a fly tire. <laughs> yes, I mean, that's the way I write. But it's just a language, you know, it's no different from, uh, from so learning to write manuscript. No, sometimes I just use a grand piano, you know. Depends what kind of mood I'm in. And on your recordings, you uh, write all the parts? You don't use the input from other people? Very much, yeah. Yeah, yeah I do use a lot of input from other people. Yeah. I mean, you see, I, g I generally use this for writing, but not for recording. And this is a good way of getting it all worked out in the privacy of my own home right. rather than spending a lot of valuable studio time. So that when I get into the studio, when I start arranging with other people, um, I've got a good idea of what I'm going to do. But um, it, it's, it's kind of tricky working with machines and people at the same time because obviously it's difficult to say to a bass player, well, I like what you're doing, but I know I could get a lot tighter with, uh, with, a, with my PBG wave computer you know, or something like that. You have to have an appreciation of what, of what kind of parts people will play well and what kind of parts machines will play well. But um, this album that I've just done, the new one, is, is generally very post-electronic. You know, I mean, I kept, when I started working with the band, I kept postponing putting any keyboards down until it got to a point where I, th where I thought, well, it doesn't really need keyboards. So a lot of the songs have not got synths on, you know, which is going to surprise a few people. But, uh, no, I mean, I, I play a lot of piano, and uh, I use a lot of natural instruments, um, string basses and acoustic guitars and violin and so on. And uh, it's more of a challenge to me, really, to do that than to just sort of twiddle a few knobs and show the world how wonderful, you know, the Moog synthesizer is, um, which I think is fairly boring. So, uh, have you thought about doing a recording on this thing? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do, I do use it for bits and pieces. Um, th there's a couple of projects coming up that that I certainly will use it for some soundtracks and so on. But um, and just little bits and pieces, you know. Oh, you remember the Lindrum school of 
Oh, I hate them. Yeah, I really hate them. Despise them. I mean, if you if you want if you want, I mean, it it just makes me stop and think. Well, what what are drums for? You know, it's really the physical power of the drums in the room, and a guy playing them that that gives you that feeling. And if you want it coming out of a little box that size, then what's the point in uh, getting a sound that everybody else gets as well? You know, and it's just so easy to set up a Lin and to program it. And there's only a set number of drum patterns with a few ger variations that anybody ever uses for pop music these days. So I think if you're going to do that, then why not set up the sounds from scratch and get something a bit individual? Um, so it's the visuals, not for back to that again, I guess. Well, not just the visual. I mean, I think that, that people are, are aware of what's gone into the making of a record. I mean, a record contains a kind of spirit, um, which is very difficult to put your finger on. And uh, I think that um, it comes over, you know, even to non-musical people, to everybody. When I know that when I've had fun making a record, that's the way it sounds. And when I've been bored and apathetic or whatever, then you might as well forget it, because that's what is communicated to the audience. You're still in the heart, I think that's right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The soundtracks I mean, that you're working on, are they for feature films? Or yeah, yeah. Um, Obviously nothing I can give away. <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean... A lot of lengthy features, though. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, there's so much involved in it, you know, I mean, it's very often what happens nowadays is that a composer is picked, you know, whether it be a John Williams or a Van Gallis or, or whoever, to do a soundtrack. And um, very often what happens is that, that they will deliver a, a section of music with a few suggestions and, and it's down to the editor really to mix it the way he wants. I mean, of course it doesn't happen all the way with all the time with those guys. But, I mean, you know, um, there was a very good soundtrack recently by Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits for a film called Local Hero which I, I thought was wonderful, but there again, it's not really film music in the traditional sense of it, you know. It's, it's music being used for film rather than written specifically for the, the dramatic side of the film. And I think that's an art that's got a little bit forgotten, you know. Um, I found when I'm doing soundtracks that where I fade it up in the song or what kind of instrumentation I use, um, where I cut it in the scene will completely change my perception of what's happening dramatically on the screen. You know, if I do it this way, it'll give me sympathy for this character, or if I do it that way, it'll give me, you know, make me hate this guy, or whatever, those kind of things. So it's almost like being a director again after the event, you know. And um, working from the point of view of a kind of backseat driver is something I've always enjoyed anyway. You know, I like being an activator. You know, I like when I was at school, I ran the film club and, uh, and, and, and when I was, before I started working as a musician, I, I worked a PA, you know, a live sound system. <coughs> and even my stage show, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of all this, this video and music going on. And I'm very much the activator rather than the guy up in the line, you know, to, twists and turns. And um, so film music is something that, that comes very naturally to me. And I don't object to the fact that, you know, I'm not in the spotlight, you know, that it'll be the, the star or the director or whoever who kind of takes the the uh, public applause for it, you know, I like being behind the scenes. Right, You're, are you always going to appear in the videos or like that? I think so, yeah, 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 but I mean the kind of role that I play in my videos is very often not as the central character, but just almost as a kind of narrator, in a way, um, rather like uh, Hitchcock used to make kind of cameo appearances in his films, you know. Um, I think my record company would start complaining if I played as little a part in them as that, but uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm quite happy to to you know not to be right up there in the in the lights. Yeah. Well, who's the, the old guy that's in the Body of English Sons? They got the old son. Yeah, he's a, he's a kind of English TV personality who goes on uh, kids TV shows and answers questions, you know, about. Uh, and Mr. Yeah, you know why water goes <laughs> anti-clockwise down the plug hole in the southern hemisphere and this kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> So he does have some scientific background. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the the whole thing was that when he, he came down to the studio and I told him what his lines were and we had this system of signals, you know, whereby I held up one arm and it was science, and I held up two arms and it was, she blinded me with science. And he started saying it wrong, you know, he started saying, uh, she blinded me with science. And I said, um, excuse me, uh, Dr. Pike, um, it's your kind of your intonation is a bit wrong, you know. It's really she blinded me with science, and he said, 
yes, but it would be a bit surprising if the girl blinded me with science. And so that's, that's what now opens the song, you know, because I like that so much. And I said, look, look, please just do it. And he said, right-o, right-o. <laughs> what do you tell him? But uh, it must be strange for him after a 20-year career in, uh, in English uh, TV to suddenly... I mean, I don't know to the States recently, but I should think he gets mobbed. <laughs> yeah.